right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I've truncated the title slightly just so it could fit on the front slide. Um, so just uh, to start, I'd like to give a brief overview and introduction and talk about where I'd like this, uh, this talk to go in the next 15 minutes. So I'll motivate this, uh, uh, this particular problem through uh, in intro motivation. I'll talk about why it is that this simulation, simulating this type of flow is important. I'll talk about how we simulate this, the type of large eddy simulation which we're employing to get the data, and then, then the what, the results, what we found, what we've discovered, and why it's interesting and why it's applicable to the problems of interest. And I'll conclude and show a little bit of uh, future work of where this, uh, where this is going. So it's not a hard stretch to see why rocket propulsion systems are, uh, are greatly important in global communications, national security, um, as well as scientific exploration, the GPS satellites, the, the space station, there's a number of different apparatus that need to be put into low Earth, low Earth orbit um, for, uh, for research purposes. Furthermore, due to the privatization of the space sector, there are, there's expected to be an increase of these private, space, uh, private rocket launches um, over the next decade or so. In fact, the FAA has predicted a doubling of private launches, rocket launches, um, each year for the, for the next uh, decade. So there's going to be this natural demand for more, <clears throat> more efficient and more reliable rocket propulsion systems. So one of the key ingredients to the rocket uh, propulsion system is, is a ro the rocket nozzle, the nozzle itself, where the hot gas is being ejected into the atmosphere. And one of the things limiting the efficiency of the nozzle is the overexpansion ratios, or the expansion ratio of the nozzle, which is the geometric ratio between the exit area and the area of the throat, or where the area is its smallest. So you typically want this to be quite large. The larger the expansion ratio, the faster the hot gas is accelerated. And as it's accelerated and jettisoned in the atmosphere, it creates larger amounts of thrust. However, this becomes problematic at low, uh, low levels. If you have an overexpansion ratio that's too aggressive, then you have what's called flow separation. You have the, the flow separates from the walls of the, of the nozzle itself. And this becomes problematic. And this is typically caused by a, a shock wave, which is, which is occurring. As the, as the flow is accelerated, the pressure is also dropping precipitously. And due to this pressure drop, it, it jumps through a shock wave to equilibrate to the atmospheric pressure. And when this occurs, there's a shock wave which emerges, and the shock wave is oftentimes asymmetric, and its position is unsteady. So the asymmetry and the unsteadiness leads to these lateral forces, or side loads. So you're basically generating thrust in, the, in, these, normal, in these opposite directions, which is a great deal of uh, uh, problems, causes a great deal of problems when you're trying to stabilize the rocket at uh, lower altitudes. So typically, one designs around this and just shifts uh, the curve upwards and just has a, a less aggressive no uh, nozzle design, which leads to more inefficient rockets at higher um, altitudes. So it's a trade-off. Here's a, a video of the, um, of the space shuttle launch. This is, it's in a transient overexpansion state. So you can see the shock wave as it exits. If you watch carefully, the nozzle actually shudders as this occurs. And after, after it's reattached and it, now it's steady, then it vectors and then it's allowed to take off. But during this transient stage, it's a very uh, precarious situation which they want to avoid. So there are a great deal of experiments that exist out there to understand the unsteadiness that's occurring. The shock wave as it interacts with the turbulent boundary layer and how it causes the uh, unsteadiness of the, the nozzle itself. They're typically done in simplified geometries. For example, here's a simple planar geometry of uh, a few experimentalists out of UC Irvine. And they found that this supported the existence of a shock wave. And here's a picture of the diagram that might exist somewhere in this divergent section here of the shock wave shown by these lines here. The shock wave is asymmetric. It causes a large separation region to occur on one side and a smaller on another, and then it becomes quite unstable, oscillating forward and back um, spontaneously. So they're able to discover that this unsteadiness occurs in these types of configurations. However, the mechanism driving the instability was not understood uh, through the experimental data. So given the complexity of this interaction, it's, it's, it's hard to, to look at all portions of the flow simultaneously through experimental data. So here's, a, here's a, actual an image of the, of the experiment. This is known as a Schlieren. It's a, it's a photograph, effectively, of the density gradient through the, through the nozzle. And you can see the shock wave and the separated shear layer, turbulence downstream of the shock wave. So one would naturally like to turn to simulation. We are all computational scientists. Turn to simulation to help elucidate the flow physics of what's, what's going on, what's going on behind the scenes here. So one traditional approach is, um, is, is a RANDS methodology. So Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, which are the governing equations, but they're average. And it's a, it's a much less expensive way. You can uh, produce a solution quite rapidly. You get, you get main uh, details of the flow, the shock more or less, the separation, the asymmetry, 
And you, can, you can use it to, as in the design process. However, this particular RANS model does not predict at all the, uh, the unsteadiness. It's, it's a steady RANS calculation. So we want to turn to a more high fidelity approach that captures more of the scales of motion. So RANS, again, averages all these turbulent scales. They're all modeled, and you get this diffusive looking uh, flow. In the LES approach, we're explicitly resolving as many of these turbulent scales as possible. That's why it's large eddy simulations, so eddies or, or turbulent motion of larger scales, the scales that contain the most amount of energy, and we're explicitly resolving them on a computational mesh. So this is the type of result that you might expect from an LES calculation, and this is from our calculation of, uh, it's, it's a similar plotted on the uh, identical geometry and flow conditions, and we see the shock wave structure is much more uh, predictive compared to the experiment, as is the separation downstream of the shock wave. So the particular flavor of LES uh, we're, we're doing is called implicit LES, and we, we're using the Miranda code, which is developed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And this, uh, this is a picture of Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which has absolutely nothing to do with, the, with our simulation, and other than that it's the same code used. In fact, if you Google CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and you click I'm, uh, I'm feeling lucky, then this is a picture that pops up on the Wikipedia page. This is, uh, so Miranda is ubiquitous with CFD. This is a high fidelity uh, 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 code. It uses high order numerics. It's solving the compressible Navier-Stokes equations, and it uh, scales up to 64,000 CPUs. This is what's been tested on at 98% efficiency, and that was on a domain size of about 2 billion grid points. Uh, it's, again, as I mentioned, it's implicit uh, LES methodology, and our current contribution is the, the introduction of this curvilinear transformation to be able to handle this arbitrary curvilinear mesh of the nozzle has a contour as well as adding uh, shot capturing for these types of grids. So uh, this is our, the suite of, um, of problems that we ran. We ran a number of different LES simulations, and the, the mesh sizes range from 4 million all the way up to 150 million grid points. We burned through about 2.7 million CPU hours, um, and we ran on th three different machines at Livermore, Hera, Atlas, and RZ Zeus. And here is a... Uh, this is a snapshot of the data, more or less, to describe what the flow field might look like. We have a, a section here where we're introducing the, the turbulence, this turbulent, these turbulent structures near the wall, which are being convected downstream as the nozzle expands, and then it pass, they pass through a shock wave, and then the shock wave destabilizes the boundary layer, which separates off the wall and introduces larger scales of motion. So this picture is actually best, I think, visualized uh, in, in the movie form. So again, this is the, this is the experimental geometry of Papa Moshko et al., the guys at UC Irvine. And then here's an experimental Schlieren of the divergent section of the nozzle. And now we switch into the simulation. Uh, and there's this three-dimensional data and, um, that we're visualizing here. The, the vortical structures are being visualized by what's known as a Q criterion, which isolates the, the, um, basically the eddies of the, the vortical structure, the turbulent boundary layer. And then the, the shock wave is being visualized by uh, using, taking the divergence of the velocity field, which is a good indicator of uh, shock location. So this is uh, 80,000 times slower than, than real time in the actual experimental device. And we see all these convective eddies uh, as they're accelerated down the length of the nozzle passing through the shock wave, distorting the, the lambda foot itself, but the, the mean position of the shock wave in the frame of reference of the of the vortical structures is, is effectively stationary. And then downstream, we see there's a broadening of scales. The boundary layer lifts from the wall, and there's subsequent reflected uh, shock waves and expansion waves downstream. So, so one thing that was observed in both the experiment and our LES simula uh, our simulation um, was this low frequency unsteadiness. So when I say low frequency, it's all relative. It's actually happening very quickly, uh, um, but relative to the turbulent scales of motion. So this plot is actually, um, I'd like to discuss this for a second. It's a little difficult to wrap your head around. So this is uh, energy spectrum, um, the fluctuating energy in pressure as a function of x, so, so spatial location in the nozzle, and frequency. So upstream of the shock, so x zero to three, this is before the shock occurs, most of the energy is contained in these higher wave numbers or the higher frequencies. And this makes sense. The incoming turbulent boundary layer have these tight, small vortices that are generating all kinds of uh, high frequency noise. And that's where most of the energy is co-located. And then as you get to the shock wave, you see the emergence of this low frequency structure. Effectively, the peak of this energy up here is actually off the, off the chart because we don't have enough sampling. Um, but it's there. 
is effectively, this peak down here is effectively three orders of magnitude slower. So you have this low frequency motion of the shock wave, which is, which is three orders of magnitude slower than the actual uh, turbulent uh, eddy turnover time. So the mechanism driving this instability was, well, it, it's, it's still unknown, but it was observed in the experimental data. And here's just a, a graph showing our three different mesh res resolutions with the experimental data showing this low frequency oscillation. And they have this secondary mode and then the higher frequencies uh, on, on up to the higher uh, wave numbers. So we looked at what the, in frequency space, this low frequency oscillation, but it actually, it helps quite a bit to look at the, in physical space to see actually what's occurring. So this is, again, this is three dimension, this is a, a 2D Schlieren um, of the simulation. Now it's played back 10 times faster so you can see the actual motion of the shock wave. You know, see the convective structure moving quite rapidly, but we can still see the motion of the shock as it moves, plunges upstream, and then the shock wave actually changes its form, becomes more one dimensional before it retreats back downstream. And as it moves downstream, the Mach number of the shock wave increases, increasing the severity of the separation, and then it's allowed to plunge back uh, upstream yet again. And it's cyclic. It, it fails to find an equilibrium. It's constantly chasing itself around, uh, overcompensating. So, so what's occurring here is, uh, is basically this. So this is, these are the two signals of shock location in black and area ratio shown in green. And they're basically identical, however, there's a phase lag between the two. And the phase lag is associated with the time it takes for a signal from the exit plane telling the, the shock wave that, hey, there's a large, great deal of separation which is occurring, and now I have this constricted area to propagate to the shock wave. And then the shock wave responds. And when the shock wave responds, it begins to move upstream. And once it moves upstream, by its very nature of the 1D approximation of a shock wave, it becomes a weaker magnitude, meaning that the severity of the separation downstream of the shock is weakened. And with a decreased uh, separation, the flow is allowed to, it's alleviated, the constriction is alleviated, and the flow is allowed to retreat back downstream uh, as the shock wave moves. And it's constantly chasing itself around, and because of this phase lag, it fails to find an equilibrium. So this is the proposed mechanism which we observed through LES data, and we're proposing is, is what's driving this instability of this low frequency. So, one of the main costs of this simulation is the large um, time scale and length scale dis disparity. You have these small, small eddies which are convecting, which we need to resolve spatially and temporally, and they're moving through the shock wave, which are on the order of three to four orders of magnitude faster and smaller than the shock wave and the, structure and the low frequency dynamics of the nozzle. Yeah, it's the low frequency dynamics that are of greater importance when calculating these side loads and the design of a rocket nozzle is more efficient. So we want to <coughs> ignore for the time being the effect of the boundary layer and use our LES data to inform that model and instead construct a simple um, one-dimensional approximation of the nozzle which is much less expensive. So these are simple 1D equations that uh, those in the aeroastro community are more than familiar with. It's based off first principles and we construct this reduced order model which can capture the low frequency dynamics and is much less expensive. In fact, it's about 1.4 times 10 to the 8 times uh, less expensive to solve this simple um, ODE as opposed to solving this full set of coupled PDEs. So you get much less information, but you, do, you can track the location of the shock quite robustly. So here's a, a, a simple movie showing the tracking of the shock wave as a function of time. It tracks the shock wave and, and, and the separation downstream. And it's the frequency and, and the severity of separation which would dictate the, um, the asymmetry. And here we show a trace of the two signals uh, showing that the, the model is actually recovering the LES uh, data quite well. And here's a, we ran it for a number of cases and showed that it uh, robustly um, um, captures this instability. So to conclude, um, we've performed a series of high fidelity uh, LES sim, um, large eddy simulations to help elucidate this unsteadiness which is occurring in rocket nozzles, which may, um, understanding it will lead to more efficient designs of rocket nozzles and, uh, jet pro and propulsion systems. Um, we discovered this, the mechanism uh, and we devised a model, a reduced order model, which is much less expensive and can capture this low frequency and steadiness. Um, moving forward, we'd like to generalize this reduced order model for all classes of shock boundary layer interactions so they could be more applicable to general um, areas of engineering. And also try it on a more realistic nozzle, something that's axial, uh, axial and has a larger, more aggressive area ratio. And then we'd look at, like to look at ways to control this instability, to turn it, toggle it on and off in an active and a passive way.
Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the DOE and the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship for their funding, wonderful support, the Krell Institute and all the staff for their professionalism and their outstanding, uh, so outstanding work. Uh, my professor, Sanjeeva Lele, uh, and Stanford Aero Astro Department, um, Drs. Cook and Cabot at Livermore for use of their code, and Drs. Papamoshko and Johnson at, uh, at Irvine for generously sharing their experimental data. And family, I'd like to, finally, I'd like to thank my family, uh, my wife, Renee, and our sons, uh, Will and Elliot for their loving support. Um, weren't able to make it here, but they're here in spirit and in JPEG. So um, <laughs> with that, I will uh, conclude.